लोग वापस जा रहे हैं सपने जल्दी करो so good morning everyone we are very much thankful to you all for joining us from different places for listening today's speaker professor david williams before starting uh, today's presentation we would like to uh, share with you all that regional science center bhopal is celebrating today international asteroid day a very important day i think it's very important for all of us as a humanity as well because tungaskas event in 1908 was very much inspiring to be declared this day as international asteroid day by the united nations so that we can think about future space exploration as well as we can also can we can also be prepared for future such collisions if happens in future uh, so how we can we save or survive on this planet what will be our option b in that situation so the asteroid day is not only for that uh, tungaskar event it is also very important and relevant for creating awareness about asteroid and their importance in our planetary exploration and also for life on planet earth so today we have very special guest on this occasion professor david williams from state arizona state university and he is very very renowned scientist in the field and he is also very much part of uh, nasa psyche mission he is going to talk about the nasa psyche mission uh, on this program and uh, before starting this uh, lecture i would like to share with you all that he is having at present covid and uh, he contracted the covid and is still i am saluting his uh, uh, will and spirit that he is with us today and he is going to share his experiences about this this subject and especially about the psyche mission of nasa's upcoming very prestigious mission and we are very help, uh, thankful to him and the the pi of the mission uh, that uh, you are sharing your experiences with us on this very space okay this is special occasion and i'm sure sir this will be first indian talk as far as psyche mission is concerned so dr williams is a research professor in the school of earth and space exploration at uh, arizona state university tampa arizona david is professor david is currently performing research in volcanology and planetary geology with a focus on planetary mapping remote sensing computer modeling studies he was involved with nasa's magellan mission to venus galileo mission to jupiter down mission to asteroid vesta dwarf planet ceres and isas mars express orbiter he is currently deputy image lead on nasa's psyche mission he is also fellow of geological society of america and he is also co investigator and one more one more important day on this day we are celebrating international asteroid day one asteroid named after him the number the number of asteroid is asteroid 10461 day williams and we have very great honor indeed a pleasure on behalf of our regional science center and our council national council of science museums for joining us directly from your place in late night uh for this cause So, sir, now it stays with yours. Please continue, sir. Thank you for joining us. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, I apologize uh, for the technical difficulties here, and also, hopefully, I'll be able to articulate what I want to talk about, having uh, dealing with COVID right now. Also, I'm giving this on behalf of our Psyche mission uh, principal investigator, Dr. Linda Elkins Tanton. She's not able to to be here because she is very much working on some uh, issues related to the NASA Psyche mission. Uh, but I am happy to be able to talk to you about it, and I am going to share my screen right now. And uh, just to confirm that you can see this screen, is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So what I'd like to do is talk you to you about what we call our mission to asteroid psyche. We call it a journey to a metal world. And before I begin, I like to give some background uh, about why we choose to explore space. There's a, a a select number of reasons why we choose to explore space. As a scientist, a planetary scientist, of course, we want to do it to understand the universe, to understand the cosmos. 
But there's a variety of other reasons why uh, we choose to explore space and why individual nations want to explore space. To do it for national prestige, great nations undertake great things. To do it for national security, to maintain the high ground, to protection from adversaries. We do it for economics, to identify and exploit space resources that can enhance national economies. We do it for sustainability, to develop new technologies to better preserve the earth and its citizens. We do it for education and inspiration. We want to inspire and create the next generation of scientists and engineers. And perhaps most importantly, we do it for survivability. Uh, you know, the reason why the dinosaurs aren't here is because they didn't have a space program. They weren't able to detect and deflect the asteroid that struck the Earth 65 million years ago that wiped them out. So to avoid the dinosaurs, dinosaurs' fate, we want to transform humanity into a multi-planet species. And these are the reasons why we choose to explore space. Now, in the United States, we have a civilian space agency called NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This slide sort of uh, tells uh, American audiences what NASA is actually constituted as that, um, you know, most because most people think of human space flight and there's components of NASA that are directed to that, but there's also a science mission directorate. And that science mission directorate, which has five divisions, is the one that funds all of the scientists in the United States who do research. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide there, we have divisions for studying the sun, the earth, uh, things outside of the solar system, biology and physical sciences related to space, and of course, planetary science. And that's what funds people like me and funds all of the NASA robotic planetary missions like Psyche. Now, when we think about how we explore the solar system with robotic spacecraft, there's actually a logic that we apply on how to do that. We do it in what is called a phased approach. We do what's technically possible, what we have the engineering skills to accomplish, we do what's affordable, what the U.S. government will give NASA the money to, to do. We do the easy missions first, we accomplish them successfully, and then we move on to the more complex missions. And you can see in this listing here, I've listed the different types of missions in increasing size, difficulty, and complexity. The easiest being a flyby, the initial reconnaissance of a body, you take pictures as you go past, and then to things that are more difficult, more complex, from orbiters to landers, to rovers, to robotic sample return, leading, of course, to human missions, crewed missions that orbit and land on other planetary bodies. This chart here sort of shows the current status of solar system exploration by humanity. And you can see those different modes of exploration across the top. You see the major objects of the solar system from the planet Mercury at the top, all the way down to Pluto and the Kuiper belt. And you can see that uh, the initial reconnaissance of all these bodies has been done, uh, starting with the Mariner 2 flyby of Venus in 1962 and the uh, Kuiper Belt flyby by the NASA New Horizons spacecraft on January 1st of 2019. So what we're doing is trying to fill in more of the chart there. And you can see most of the inner solar system has been visited by orbiters. Uh, uh, most of the small uh, inner planets and small bodies visited by landers of one type or another. When you move to the more complex, such as rovers, such as sample return, there's been less of that. And then crewed missions, we've only had the Apollo missions to the moon. So things that are in green are things that have been uh, approved or funded by the US government or other international space agencies. Things that are in yellow or orange there have not yet been completely funded, but are in the design stages. So as a big Star Trek TV show fan in the United States, I like to say that our goal is to completely fill in this chart, to completely explore our own solar system, and then we'll be able to boldly go where no one has gone before. So with that preamble, let me now talk about this on this International Asteroid Day, talk a little bit about asteroids, what they are, why they're important, and why we care about Psyche, the asteroid Psyche. I'll tell you a little bit about our Psyche mission, what its objectives, the instruments and operations, how it will work, what we expected results we hope to get. And then I'll do a look ahead, looking at some of the other active uh, asteroid missions going on and where we will we be going in the future. And then I'll conclude with a Q&A that, that can be moderated. So to begin with, asteroids. Asteroids are minor planets, they're protoplanets, they're small bodies, rocky bodies in our solar system with diameters, generally less than 500 kilometers in diameter. They're mostly irregularly shaped like asteroid Lutetia you see in this picture, mostly composed of silicate rock and dust, and they may or may not have volatiles. And what that means is ice. 
like water ice or maybe something else. Most asteroids are located in the main asteroid belt located between the orbits of the planets Mars and Jupiter, but there are other populations of asteroids throughout the solar system. There's a population called the Trojan asteroids, which are at the Lagrange orbits of the planet Jupiter, that is 60 degrees in front and behind the planet Jupiter in its orbit around the sun. There's a population called centaurs that orbit between the orbits of the planets Jupiter and Neptune. And then there's the ones that you hear about probably most often are the near-Earth asteroids, of which there are several different types. And these are the ones whose orbits either come to or cross that of the Earth. And these are the ones that are potentially hazardous. There's about 4,700 of these that could potentially, at some point in the future, uh, strike the Earth or come at least very close to the Earth or the Moon or one of the inner planets. And I just listed a few of them here. There's also occasionally really oddball things like this, our first extra uh, solar uh, visitor uh, that you might remember from 2017. Uh, Oumuamua was the name that they gave that. And it looks something like this, an artist concept. We now think that this is actually a piece of, a, of an extrasolar dwarf planet that just happened to pass through our solar system. But asteroids and comets, you know, having coming from, uh, you know, other parts of the solar system, they do have a potential threat. And there are programs by uh, NASA and other space agencies to track the, the certainly the near-Earth asteroids, the ones that could pose a danger to us. In this talk, though, we want to talk a little bit more about asteroids. And most of what we know about asteroids becomes from the reflected light that we see in telescopes from these objects or from meteorites, because meteorites are pieces of asteroids that have fallen on the surface of the Earth. And from analysis of all of this, we know that there's about 14 different types of asteroids. The C type are carbonaceous, make up the bulk of them. The S are stony type, the next highest amount. There's the D and P, dark primitive, which actually the Trojan asteroids make up this category. V type uh, for volcanic uh, corresponds to asteroid number four named Vesta that was visited by the Dawn mission, which I worked on about 10 years ago. And then there's the M class and M type asteroids uh, stands for metallic. We think these are iron cores that are preserved from the origin of the solar system. All of this data tells us that asteroids are the rocky remnants from the formation of the solar system that never coalesced into a planet. In particular, the asteroids in the main belt were never able to form a planet because of the gravitational tides of the planet Jupiter is so massive they would have kept it from forming a planet. Now, when it comes to spacecraft exploration of asteroids, most spacecraft that have seen asteroids have actually been uh, targeted at some other object in the solar system. I was a graduate student at Arizona State University in 1991 when the Galileo spacecraft on its way out to Jupiter flew by asteroid 951 Gaspra, and then two years later, 243 Ida. And if you're wondering what these numbers mean, every asteroid is assigned a number in the order in which it was discovered. So the higher the number, the more recently it's been discovered. And uh, it isn't until the year 2000 that NASA sent the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous to the near-Earth asteroid 433 Eros. That was the first robotic mission dedicated to an asteroid exploration by the United States. And then these other missions, the Japanese Hayabusa mission, the Dawn mission, Hayabusa 2, leading to the uh, more current missions, OSIRIS-REx, which has completed its asteroid sample return. The samples are on its way back to Earth. And the two active NASA missions that are in flight, Lucy to visit the Trojans that launched last year and Psyche, which is coming up. So here's a great graphic uh, that you see here. This shows all of the asteroids and comets that were visited by spacecraft prior to the dawn arrival at asteroid 4 Vesta in 2011. And you can see just as examples, these are regularly shaped bodies. You see they're heavily cratered. On some of them, you might be able to see boulders. You might be able to see lineations uh, or other features on them, but just uh, giant rocks in space. But as you get to be larger in size, the potential for planetary processes might occur on some of them. So we're interested in a particular asteroid, the 16th asteroid that was discovered, which was named Psyche. It is the largest of the M-type asteroids. So it's, you see these uh, telescopic shape models here that uh, it's very much not round, it's a more of a potato shape. <clears throat> it was discovered by Hannibale de Gasparis of Naples back in March 17th of 1852. It orbits at about 2.9 astronomical units, and an astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the Earth, so it's, it's out there near the outer edge of the main asteroid belt. 
orbits the sun in about five years, rotates on its axis in a little over four hours. And, uh, you know, uh, we think since uh, we, this, this metallic asteroid is probably composed of iron, it could be the source of some types of iron meteorites. Um, you know, it has, certainly has a density that would be consistent with that. At least that's what we thought when we first started studying this body, but it does have some porosity. So there could be something more complex than just being a hunk of iron metal out there. And that's one of the things we want to discover through our Psyche mission. How big is the asteroid 16 Psyche? Well, here you see the asteroid Vesta, which is uh, pretty large. It's about the size of one of the Western states in the United States. You see Lutetia, which was the big one on the previous graphic. And then you see a bunch of smaller asteroids there. When you put Psyche on there, you see it's about that size there. That's 279 by 232 by 189 kilometers. Or yes, this will probably be more for US audiences or if you visit the United States, it's about the size of the state of Massachusetts or the distance between Phoenix and Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, here's another graphic showing Vesta and Psyche and then down to Eros and then a very small one, Bennu, which was just sampled by OSIRIS-REx. So we're talking about a relatively large asteroid, but not the largest uh, like Vesta or Ceres. Now, when you create a planetary mission of the type of like Psyche, the Psyche mission is, you want to go explore it and have some very specific science objectives you want to accomplish. You want to make sure you're accomplishing a certain kind and amount of science to make it worth sending the mission. So for the driving question for 16 Psyche is, could it be the core of an asteroid parent body? And I'll explain why we think that might be the case there. So Going to this asteroid, we want to answer some specific science questions. Is Psyche a planetary core or is it just a chunk of unmelted metal? What are the relative ages of the different regions on its surface? Do small metal bodies incorporate light elements that could be found in the Earth's high pressure core? Could Psyche have formed under more oxidizing or more reducing conditions than the Earth's core? And then what is the topography of this world? You can see from these shape models that there's evidence of some impact craters on the surface. So we at least know that that's gonna be there. So the idea that we have for a 16 Psyche was that early in the formation of the solar system, you had pebbles and rocks that were accreting, combining together to form planetismals that would form planetary embryos that would then combine to form planets. But at some point, you might have had something that might have had a crust, mantle, and core like the Earth, but a lot of that would have been knocked off by impacts. And so this cartoon here shows you a planetismal with a crust and mantle and a molten core that was struck in a hit and run impact that basically knocked off most of the crust and mantle, exposing a molten iron core that then would slowly start to crystallize, it would expunge any sulfur that would be associated with it. It might've had a magnetic field that would have been locked into place as it finally cooled. So this is one scenario for asteroid 16 Psyche. So to go and investigate those options, we need a spacecraft. So here you see a graphic of what the Psyche spacecraft looks like as it was being developed and you see a, a human for scale. You see, it's basically an Earth orbiting uh, satellite that's been modified. It's got a high gain antenna for communication. It's got some booms which have the science instruments. We're going to carry a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, and we're going to carry magnetometers. And we, over here, we got a couple of cameras. This is, I, I have to have propulsion on a spacecraft, and we actually use solar electric ion propulsion. I'll talk more about that, powered by solar panels there. And then we're carrying an extra instrument called Deep Space Optical Communication. This is a test instrument and it's gonna test whether you can send information via laser communication uh, from Earth to the spacecraft. So if you unfold the solar panels, you can see it's a pretty big size. Here's the human, the scale on the left there. So it's about a size of a tennis court when you unfold the solar panels. So the way that this mission is going to work after we launch with a standard rocket that uses chemical propellants, we're going to boost out of Earth's gravity and then we're gonna fire up our ion engines. And uh, when you, wherever you see gray along the lines of the orbit, that means that's when we're firing our ion engines. The blue dots are when we're gonna be testing the deep space optical communication. So we're gonna be testing it as we go out to Mars, go do a Mars gravity assist. And then uh, we're gonna spiral around the sun because this is the way you move with ion propulsion. 
you spiral around thrusting as you move ever, ever outward in the solar system until we catch up with asteroid psyche. And then the ion engines will place us into orbit. And then over the course of two years, we will go from an orbit at a very high altitude, orbit A, to B, to C, to D, to, a, to successfully lower altitudes to apply our science instruments. Now, I mentioned ion propulsion. Why do we want to use ion propulsion? Well, it's basically a cost-saving measure because this particular mission is one of NASA's discovery class. It's one of our smallest robotic missions. And if you wanted to travel to this asteroid using normal chemical propellant, it would increase the amount of mass on the spacecraft, which would increase the cost of the mission outside of the discovery cost range. And so to make it affordable as a mission, uh, we use solar electric ion propulsion. And the way this works is the sunlight hits the solar panels, transform them to electricity. We're carrying around a very low mass fuel like xenon. The uh, electricity ionizes the xenon, passes them through a magnetic field, which pr pr produces uh, the propulsion and it moves the spacecraft. And uh, the advantage of this is that you can fire these thrusters over a very long period of time, weeks to months, to build up a, a very fast uh, uh, acceleration to get where you're going. The problem is, is this acceleration is very slow, so it takes a long time to get where you're going. It's going to take about three and a half to four years from launch until we actually arrive at our target asteroid. The spacecraft itself, this body was built by Maxar Technologies, which has a long history of Earth orbiting communication satellites that are stabilized by electric propulsion. So this graphic here shows you that when we get to our asteroid, the four different orbits, and each of these orbits is optimized for a particular instrument or instruments to gather information. You want to get sort of a global imaging of the asteroid to identify its features as well as determine if it has a magnetic field. We also are going to look as we approach to see if there's any moons because you wanna be careful if an, if an asteroid can have a, a moon. We know that, that some asteroids do. Um, so we wanna make sure we don't run into anything. And then as we move down in each orbit, we'll do high resolution imaging, color imaging, get stereo topography, uh, drop down to get high resolution gravity and eventually use our our, our nuclear spectroscopy instruments, gamma and neutrons to get uh, elemental abundances of the surface. So this is just another graphic, you don't need to read this, um, but it basically just says what I just said verbally is that each orbit is optimized and we'll get certain images. Now, we are gonna be able to collect images at different resolutions as we get closer. So our first orbit, orbit A, we'll be able to get images at 35 meters per picture element. So we'll be able to image features as, as small as 35 meters in size on the surface. And as we go lower over the course of the mission from 15 to nine to ultimately about four meters per pixel in the final uh, orbit. So what instruments are we carrying on our Psyche spacecraft? Well, you obviously need something to see the surface. So we're carrying two imagers for redundancy effects. The imagers are built uh, by Malin Space Science Systems in San Diego, California, and our being led by uh, where I work, uh, my department at, at Arizona State University. So we're gonna be looking at, at the surface uh, in uh, black and white or grayscale. That allows us to give the, uh, what we call the albedo or brightness of the surface. We're gonna look for the, <coughs> excuse me, the morphology or the shape of the surface, look for craters and other geologic features. But we also have a filter wheel that has seven color filters. And that's gonna give us more information about the composition of silicate and sulfide minerals that could exist on the surface. <clears throat> we also have a pair of magnetometers that were built by the Danish Technical University north of Copenhagen, the experiment being led by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And these are two flux gate magnetometers that uh, measure magnetic fields to a sensitivity of 0.1 nanotesla. And I don't quite know how sensitive that is, but I think it's pretty sensitive. And then finally, the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University in Maryland has built the gamma ray and neutron spectrometers. Gamma ray spectrometers are really good for measuring the elemental abundance of parts of the surface, the amounts of iron and nickel and silicon and potassium, whereas a uh, neutron spectrometer is really good for measuring hydrogen abundance as a proxy for the presence of water ice. 
or hydroxyls or something like that that could be on the surface. And then using the communication of the spacecraft with Earth, we're going to conduct a gravity science experiment, which means as the spacecraft orbits the asteroid, we're going to be able to determine the gravity, the, in, the configuration of the interior, if there is one, of this body. And I, the other slides here sort of build on that. That's a picture of our magnetometers where they're located on the spacecraft. Uh, this is a picture of our imagers uh, with the filter wheel, the way it looks. And these are the particular filters. As I said, we have a broadband clear filter to look at the surface for topography and for geolo geologic features. And then the other filters there are looking for minerals like sulfide, such as oldamite, which are gonna be associated with metal. And then the others are looking for various silicates like uh, olivine and pyroxene. So we'll be able to get some broad uh, characterizations of the surface composition. This is just showing the footprints of, of the imagers for each of the different orbits. And you see they're very big on orbit A, and then they get progressively smaller as you go to the other orbits. And orbits B and C will get complete global coverage. We probably won't have complete global coverage in the last orbit. And then this just is uh, showing the equipment for the gamma ray and neutron spectrometers that I just described. And then this is the concept about the gravity model here. So the idea is that when a spacecraft orbits a planetary body, if there's a localized mass concentration that slightly tugs the spacecraft down, and when it flies over a, a lack of mass, it goes back up in its orbit slightly. You can measure that very, very precisely by the Doppler time delay and the radio signals between the spacecraft and the Earth. And by taking that information, it's possible to construct a model of the interior. Are there density differences in the interior of a body? That's how we discovered the core and mantle configuration on asteroid Vesta on the Dawn mission. So when it comes to NASA missions like this, how do we develop them? Well, actually, it's a very, very long and complex process. The first uh, discussions about a mission to visit asteroid Psyche began in 2011 from our principal investigator uh, with other scientists. And then uh, writing a, an initial proposal to NASA, submitting it, it being selected in 2014 and 15, uh, getting money to do a more extensive proposal, what we call the step two or phase A proposal that was submitted. And then it was announced in January of 2017 that, that Psyche was selected to actually go to a mission. So between January of 2017 and now, we've gone through phases B, C, and D, and that's the formulization, the preliminary design, the critical design, the actual construction and building of the spacecraft and the instruments, the integration of all those components and the testing of it, and then shipping it to the Cape for eventual launch. So it's been quite a long uh, development process for this mission, even though this is one of the smaller uh, and less complex missions in, in NASA's portfolio. So this, uh, this painting here is an artist concept from when we first wrote the mission proposal, what we thought Psyche, asteroid 16 Psyche would be, uh, the exposed core of an asteroid parent body with maybe craters in the metal surface and maybe some other silicate or sulfur stuff on the surface. And we wanna try and figure out, you know, was Psyche melted? Did it solidify from the inside out, from the outside in? Is it a rubble pile or is it just unmelted metal? And so to figure this out, we're going to have to use data from all of our instruments. Now, since this proposal over the last five and a half years, all of our colleagues who do planetary astronomy have pointed their telescopes out at asteroid 16 Psyche to try and understand better the nature of this asteroid. And so They've been able to approve uh, estimates of the bulk density, uh, the amount of uh, metal that's predicted to be there, its reflectance. We think it's still largely metallic, but it's not uniquely so. Um, and so these two graphics here are two more recent renditions of the asteroid. We think it's not just one big chunk of metal that's been heavily cratered. We think that silicate is somehow mixed in with the asteroid. And the, the painting on the left is a metal body with silicate gunk covering the surface and filling in the bottoms of craters. That's one possibility. But another possibility is what if the iron metal and the silicate is more intimately mixed together? That would be something like a palisite meteorite, which I showed earlier there where you have 
uh, olivine silicate olivine crystals surrounded by an iron metal. That's one particular type of iron meteorite, the palisite. What if it could be something like that? And that's what the painting on the right is trying to show where it could be something that's intimately mixed like that. So anyway, to answer these questions about the nature of the asteroid, there's no one piece of information that will clearly tell us the answer. You have to put together the data from each of the instruments to try and, and tease out the possibilities or eliminate possibilities by looking at with the presence of magnetic field and the nature of that field on or around the surface, by looking at the percent of nickel content of the surface, whether it has sulfide minerals on it, you can sort of put in things like decision trees like this that will help answer these questions about what the nature of the asteroid would be. Now, of course, it could be something totally different that we hadn't thought of before. And that's, of course, the always the greatest aspect of exploring worlds um, is, is finding something you didn't expect that changes your insight about it. For me, I'm a geologist. I would very much like to know what does geology look like on a world that's dominantly boundary of some of the asteroid parent bodies? What if 16 Psyche is made up of something like this? These are all questions we hope to answer in our mission. So we, over the last five years, we built the spacecraft. This slide is showing you the spacecraft in the clean room at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. This was just in April of this past year. So just a couple of months ago, and there's me with the spacecraft. You can see it on the side. The solar panels would connect here. Here's the jungle gym here with the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer attached. And then this picture on the right, you see these two things that are sticking up out of that big black area. Those are the two multispectral imaging cameras that we had installed. So since the end of April, beginning of May, the spacecraft was put on an airplane and shipped to uh, the, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and it is continuing to do ATLO testing. So um, I'll come back to what we're going to do about the launch in just a minute. Let me go on and talk briefly about some of the other asteroid missions that are going on. The uh, OSIRIS-REx mission, a NASA uh, medium-sized robotic mission. OSIRIS-REx stands for this phrase that you see in the first bullet there. It launched back in September of 2016, and this was a spacecraft that orbited the near-Earth carbonaceous asteroid 101,955 Bennu a very, very small asteroid, 1,900 feet in diameter, very small. And while it orbited, it actually uh, put a robotic arm on the surface and captured a sample of this material. This was put into a sample container and is currently on its way back to Earth to land on Earth in the Utah desert in 2023. The goal of this mission is to characterize one of these near-Earth asteroids, what we think is made up of primitive material left over from the origins of the solar system. Our sister mission is named Lucy, and that mission launched last year. A couple of my colleagues, professors at Arizona State, our colleagues, uh, work, our science team members on this mission. This mission is going to visit the Trojan asteroids. I told you these are the asteroids that orbit 60 degrees in front of and behind the planet Jupiter's orbit around the sun. And this is a multi-multi-flyby mission. Um, <clears throat> it's going to visit multiple Trojan asteroids in both camps, if you will, in, in L4 and L5 Lagrange points around Jupiter. And these asteroids have never been visited by spacecraft before. They're D and P types, mostly dark and primitive. But, you know, we don't really know uh, what these uh, asteroids are like. Uh, the telescopic images are very poor. So by visiting by the spacecraft, you know, that's how we transform astronomical objects into geological objects when we can send a spacecraft to them and, and look up close. So yeah, these are, this is gonna be going over most of this next decade, over the next 10 years to, to, to study uh, these Trojan asteroids with the Lucy mission. Now, when you talk about asteroids, inevitably the idea of space mining and space resources come up. So, you know, uh, the, the idea is, is of course, if asteroids contain valuable materials that will help us build the space faring civilization I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, just for the fun of it, based on the known mass and density of, of 16 Psyche, our PI did a calculation. If, uh, if, you, look, if you assume that all of the, uh, the interior of asteroid Psyche were metal and the appropriate amounts of iron and nickel and platinum group elements, uh, that just amount would be worth 100,000 times the gross national product of all the nations on Earth or 10,000 quadrillion US dollars. 
Now, obviously, this is a little silly because once if, if you brought all the material back to Earth, those metals markets would crash and they wouldn't be worth as much. But it's a fun intellectual exercise to you know, impress upon people that that there are companies out there, commercial companies like Planetary Resources that would be very much interested in mining asteroids for whatever materials they have to help build a spacefaring civilization. And I don't think it's gonna be as easy as this top picture here where you see an asteroid with a cone on one side and it's sucking materials out of the asteroid and a space station is coming out the other side. It by no means is gonna be that easy. It's gonna be a very interesting challenge to, for humans and robots to learn how to work in the microgravity environments of asteroids. But the potential I think is gonna be very important and, you know, we're not really going to be taking materials from asteroids and bringing down the gravity well to Earth. Much more uh, uh, rather would be taking the materials from asteroids or from the lunar surface and helping them to build our spacefaring civilization. Because you have metals, you could have uh, materials that can make building materials. If you have water ice like that in the permanently shadowed regions of lunar craters, they can be used either as a source for water or for rocket fuel or oxygen. All of these options exist out there. So I think this is going to be one of the major undertakings of humanity over the course of the rest of this century. So this is my summary slide, uh, and I'll just repeat some main points here. Uh, as you watch spinning, this is the the spinning uh, um, uh, image there is the best uh, telescopic shape model of asteroid 16 Psyche that just came out last year. And the red point is just the, one of the axes of it. So asteroids are the rocky remnants from the formation of the solar system. On January 4th, 2017, NASA selected Arizona State Uni University to lead a discovery class robotic mission to visit the M-class asteroid 16 Psyche. NASA's Psyche spacecraft, just like the Dawn spacecraft before it, will use solar electric ion propulsion to move through the solar system. The Psyche spacecraft carries three instruments, a visible imager, a magnetometer, and a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. And we will use all three of those to characterize Psyche's surface. The Psyche spacecraft has been built and is ready. Uh, JPL is completing some of the software testing. Now, originally the spacecraft was supposed to launch this year, sometime between August 1st and October 13th, but NASA announced last Friday, actually, that uh, the testing of the software won't be able to be completed to meet that uh, unforgiving launch window. So we're expecting to launch at the next opportunity, which occurs next year in 2023. So uh, while we finish up the testing and make sure the spacecraft is in a really great shape and ready to launch, I expect that we'll do a review and that the launch date will be determined and it'll probably be in the start, the launch window I think will open in the summer of, of next year, 2023. Now that launch date, whenever it occurs, that will constrain how long the cruise phase will be because uh, Psyche and Earth will be in different positions on their orbit. Uh, what resources do we have on the launch vehicle that may help us get there where we're going? That is all yet to be determined. So I don't know uh, at this time the new launch date or the new arrival date, but uh, you know it, it still will occur later this decade. So I would say stay tuned and we will have more information, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as the, uh, this next year goes on. And I have a video to show. This is a concept of uh, what the uh, Psyche spacecraft will look like. And I don't think you can hear the music. I think I turned the music off on the video, but this just shows you a, <coughs> excuse you can me. can see the video, not audio. Okay, yeah, audio. it's just music. Yeah, so it's not important. But this is just an artist concept video of what the Psyche spacecraft will look like as it begins to orbit asteroid psyche. So there you see it with the solar panels deployed, flying over the surface. The solar panels will always rotate to gather the sunlight. Um, it collects data when the sunlit side is, is visible. On when the, the surface is in darkness is when it transmits the data back um, to Earth. And this is just going in for a much closer view with one possible uh, view of the surface with the shiny metallic canyon walls and presumably a uh, silica bouldery crust. Uh, we don't know whether it'll look like this or not. This is just one possibility of it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it makes a great visualization. Looking down, you see 
metal and silicate uh, yeah, filling in the low spaces on the body. And it's just going to zoom in a little closer. Now, the spacecraft won't be able to get this close, and at least not during the nominal mission, to, to see things quite this close. But it's just going in here saying, oh, well, look at this. This one is maybe a palisite uh, parent body with the olivine crystals intermixed with that. But um, and then we, we pull back here and we're flying over uh, the asteroid again. And uh, yeah, it's, it, this is the thing that makes space uh, exploration so exciting. Having worked on my share of robotic missions in my career, uh, trying to figure out what these things are going to look like and then getting there and actually being surprised that it might be something totally, totally different. <clears throat> if you're interested to learn more about the mission, you can go to psyche.asu.edu. We have videos, we have images, we have uh, educational items there uh, that are all available uh, to you there. So I think that is my last slide. Uh, yeah, that just goes to my backup. So I will stop sharing here and I will come here. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Yep. Thank you, Professor William. And I'm really grateful to you for making this engaging, enlightening presentation in a very short span of time. And I'm indeed uh, surprised the way you have presented and it did not be, uh, occur me that uh, you had uh, COVID. And for all the viewers who are watching this program, though he is very much uh, sick because of COVID-19, but his commitment and dedication for the cause of science, he is with us. Thank you, Professor uh, Williams. My on pleasure. Behalf of Regional Science Center of Bhopal. And also we are very much thankful to Principal Investigator Ma'am. He has, she has actually inspired us to be in touch with you because of her commitment, preoccupied commitments. So we'll take a few questions here, and I think questions are coming up very slowly. People may be listening, hearing, and watching. And your talk was very, very informative. And I should say it's a masterclass presentation that it had all the answers also. Some questions are arising, and in a few later slides, we, uh, we observe that you already touched upon. But I'll take a few questions. Questions are coming up. Dr. Rajesh Sarma is asking, how can we see the progress of exploration about Psyche? Well, um, yeah, that's a good question. What we will do is that <clears throat> when the data starts coming back, <clears throat> excuse me, when the data starts coming back, it will be released. I believe the plan is to put the images out very quickly because, you know, images are very easy to to process and interpret, and they'll actually go out on a web page, um, you know, where you, you the whole world will be able to see it relatively quickly. Magnetometer data, uh, gamma ray data, that requires a lot more processing. So it eventually uh, will have will will be processed and then analyzed by the team. But typically, what we do in um, the U.S. is that. Six months after data is acquired, it is archived in the NASA Planetary Data System, the PDS. And it is a publicly accessible archive where you can, you can access the, the raw data. The uh, process data and the press releases, and of course we will be doing press conferences you know, periodically during the mission, and that will have the nice graphics. And that information will be out there. One of the places that I love to get my information is the NASA Planetary Photo Journal. And it has a website, photojournal.jpl.nasa.gov. So I'll say that again, photojournal, one word, .jpl.nasa.gov. When you go to that website, it'll have a map of the solar system. You just click on the planetary body or object you're interested in. And then you can choose what mission, what instrument, and you will see whatever has been press released about that mission, along with a caption that describes whatever the image is showing there. The Mars rovers are there. Uh, the Mars orbiters are there. Uh, the Magellan images of Venus, the Galileo images of the uh, moons of Jupiter, uh, the images of Dawn and other asteroid missions are all there. So that's a really great resource to get at interpreted quick and easy result images there. Thank you. And uh, 
In between, I'll also ask a few questions so that it can become a sync of Q and session. Sir, can you a little bit elaborate about uh, electric propulsion because this mission is going to use electric propulsion rather than other forms of technology which are available. So, uh, and as I understood, uh, this has little momentum. When we use electric propulsion, momentum of the spacecraft just get affected in comparison to other methods. So why you have chosen this method? Yeah, uh, solar electric ion propulsion uh, has been around for a while. It was tested um, on uh, uh, some earlier missions um, and then it was the primary propulsion that was chosen on the Dawn mission to asteroid Vesta and Dwarf Planet Ceres. <clears throat> and the same reason we did that for, for, for Vesta and Ceres is also applies to, to Psyche. The main advantage of ion propulsion is that you can use a very low mass fuel that reduces the mass of the spacecraft, which reduces the cost of the mission. Because if you tried to use all chemical propulsion on these missions, it would make them too expensive for it to do as NASA discovery missions. So you're sort of uh, you know, saving mass, saving cost. And the trade-off is, is that it takes longer to get there because um, you know, the propulsion is, uh, the acceleration of an ion engine is very low. Uh, the Dawn spacecraft, uh, which is very similar to Psyche, it could go from zero to 60 miles per hour in four days, as opposed to your car that can probably go zero to 60 miles per hour in, you know, five seconds. But the advantage is, you know, the amount of fuel that you use on an ion engine, it, it's, it's a very small amount uh, per time. And you can fire these engines for weeks to months at a time. And that accumulates the momentum, the acceleration of the spacecraft builds. So the delta V of an ion engine over the full length of a, of a flight mission is the same as, as a typical chemical propulsion rocket with a whole bunch of solid rocket boosters. So it's basically the advantage of, of, of ion propulsion is saving mass and the saving cost at the, at the expense of taking longer to get where you're going. It'll take, it takes years to get where you're going. Okay, thank you. And now uh, we have a question from uh, Avinav. He's a student of uh, grade nine, and he's having in fact two questions. One, he's asking that, uh, are there any other known asteroids which are metallic like Psyche? The question number one, and he's also interested. Uh, please explain Maxar technology. Okay. <clears throat> yes, there are other M-class asteroids. Uh, matter of fact, I think mine, 10,461 DA Williams, is actually now classified as an M-class one, but it's only about five kilometers in length from what I've been told. Um, there are other M-class asteroids. Uh, Psyche is the largest one, and uh, it's, I think it's also the most accessible. Um, I can't remember the names of others. I think Cleopatra, with a, starting with a K, is also an M-class asteroid. So there are several, uh, there are many others in, in, the, um, in the solar system. Maxar Technologies uh, is the name of the company that built the main body of the Psyche spacecraft. They used to be called Space Systems Loral before they changed their names to Maxar Technologies. And they have a long history of building Earth orbiting satellites that use uh, ion propulsion to help stabilize their orbit. So. One of the things that made the Psyche mission affordable as a discovery mission is that is, is Arizona State University and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory partnering with Maxar Technologies to build our spacecraft. And this will be the first planetary mission, first deep space mission uh, beyond Earth orbit for Maxar. So they've been really excited and to demonstrate that their uh, ion engines and their spacecraft can work in deep space. I think the same company is also providing satellite imagery to Google Map and other maps also, the maps of technology. Yes, because yes. Of their asset. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, sir, uh, one question again from my student. He, he's also from class grade nine. And he's asking, how does this Psyche asteroid can damage the Earth's surface? Suppose, I think he's presuming that an impact, if it occurs. So how does this Psyche will affect the surface of planet Earth? <clears throat> well, the Psyche asteroid itself is in a stable orbit at the far end of the main asteroid belt. So there's absolutely no chance that the Psyche asteroid could ever impact the Earth. 
none of those big asteroids in the main asteroid belt could ever impact the Earth. So uh, if it did, it would be a very big mess. <laughs> but uh, the, a much greater concern would be the near-Earth asteroids, which are much, much smaller. Um, and, you know, they can cause, you know, great problems. And matter of fact, NASA has a near-Earth object observation program to try and identify and map the orbits of all of the Earth-crossing near-Earth asteroids. Uh, you know, the, the bigger they are, they're easier to identify and plot their orbits. Uh, there could be much smaller ones there that could still destroy a city or a small region um, if they impacted there. So those are the uh, ones that the NASA is focusing on right now. As far as I know thus far, there is no near-Earth asteroid that is in danger of hitting the Earth anytime in the near future. But it's good that space agencies have programs to study that. Okay, so uh, I'll ask very briefly, we'll take a few, uh, Two or three questions, uh, and then we will wrap up. So, sir, please also highlight a little bit the impact crater, which is in Arizona, and also in a smaller size, which that is also a kind of crater which is created, as it is believed according to the data published by various lunar planetary science scientists across the world. In India, we also have in a state Maharashtra lunar lunar crater. It, we call a uh, uh, it's a kind of pond with a bigger pond. So it is also created because of an impact. And as we all are celebrating this uh, asteroid day, so please also touch upon Tungaska event because it's very important. Without an impact crater, Tungaska's whole uh, you know, jungle and the area were affected because of the explosion, I think, in the air. So how do you see that as far as uh, planetary science or geologically uh, uh, your analysis is concerned? Yeah, when we think about planetary geology, you can reduce geology into four basic processes, volcanism, tectonism, gradation, which is basically weathering erosion and deposition of materials by wind, water, gravity, etc. And then, of course, the fourth is impact cratering. And impact cratering is the dominant geologic surface modding process on most of the solar system, certainly on the asteroids certainly on uh, uh, Mercury and the moon, although they've also been very heavily uh, influenced by volcanic activity. Here uh, in Arizona, yes, you mentioned Meteor Crater up near Winslow. I was actually just up there uh, on a geology field trip. Uh, when was that? That was the uh, last week of May, uh, first week of June. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's a wonderful place. It's, uh, it's where, impact craters were first studied and helps, you know, train the Apollo astronauts on, you know, the understanding of impact craters because the flatlying stratigraphy of rock layers in Arizona are actually overturned on the rim of Meteor Crater. And that is one of the cardinal signatures that, an imp that a hole in the ground is actually an impact crater. One of the other ones is the intense heat and pressure of an impact will change quartz minerals into these high pressure phases called coazite and stichovite. If you see, if you find that in a big hole, that means that hole was produced by an impact. So yeah, impacts are very important. There's what, uh, between 150 and 170 impact craters that are discovered on earth. Your fa uh, famous one in India, Lonar, is, is one of the only impact craters into volcanic basaltic material. Basalt is volcanic rock, like what flows from lava flows in Hawaii. And it's been studied by various folks, both in your country and mine, to help understand how does an impact into volcanic material occur and what, what happens to it. Because we see a lot of impact craters and the volcanic lava flows of the lunar mare on the moon or the lava flows on Mars there. So they're very, those are all very important features to study. And you mentioned Tung Tungusta, where you had something, whether it was a comet or an asteroid, come in and had an, <coughs> an aerial burst. <clears throat> excuse me, that didn't produce an impact crater, but it knocked down trees. So that was an aerial burst where the, uh, the object exploded in the sky and not produced an impact crater. We had the same thing occur in 2012, I believe, in Chelyabinsk, Russia. That was an aerial burst, and they actually caught images of that. Uh, it didn't really produce a crater. There was just some material that fell down to the earth. So yeah, in, you, you have impacts. Um, you know, very well-preserved ones like our meteor crater, um, 
uh, Lonar, and then there's others that have been very, very heavily modified. And a lot of scientists have studied these craters and continue to do so to help inform us when we un to understand craters that we see in images of the other objects in the solar system. Okay, sir. So now uh, we have a few more questions. One is uh, from, again, a student of, uh, he's like, asking, and he's trying to emphasize the asteroid mining concepts. What is your take on that? And one uh, gentleman is also touching silicate, uh, the finding of silicate on asteroids. So do you have any comment on it? Then I'll come back again for your comments, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, asteroids, um, you know, most asteroids are silicate, the, the S-type, uh, which means they're dominated by silicate minerals, you know, quartz, uh, feldspar, you know, pyroxenes, all of mean, those, those types of minerals that make up a lot of the Earth's crust. The C-type asteroids are the carbonaceous ones, and that just means there's a lot of uh, carbon-containing materials in them. Um, so, you know, that, that's part of the diversity of asteroids. Um, you know, the vast majority of our collection are, are asteroids that are um, uh, chondrites, which have uh, chondrules, uh, little round nodules left over from the solar nebula in them. Achondrites without those are the ones that come from planetary bodies. So we have meteorites uh, from the moon. We have meteorites from Mars. And we have a particular family of meteorites called the HEDs, standing Howardite, Eucrite, and Diogenite, and they all come from asteroid Vesta or, or similar V-type asteroids. It'd be interesting to see if we could find some, asteroid, uh, some meteorites that come from different bodies. And perhaps when we discover, uh, when we explore asteroid 16 Psyche, we may come to the conclusion that one or more particular families of iron meteorite, maybe that is their parent body, their source. <clears throat> in regards to asteroid mining, you know, as I said there, you know, it's, it's very unclear right now just what is going to be useful on asteroids to help build a spacefaring civilization. Most people, when they talk about that, I think are more focused on the moon because that is going to be the place where we send humans back to next. I'm certain the People's Republic of China are going to have uh, uh, taikonauts uh, their own astronauts on the surface of the moon by the end of this decade. There's a plan in the United States to send uh, our own astronauts as part of the Artemis program back to the lunar surface by, you know, hopefully before the end of this decade. Um, and there's resources on the moon. You know, a, a lot of people talk about putting a base down at the lunar south pole because we know that there is water ice preserved in the permanently shadowed regions of craters at the south pole. Also, if you put your solar panels on a rotating uh, staff on the rim of one of those south polar craters, you'll be able to get sunlight all year round to power your base. Whereas if you're in an equatorial region on the moon, you have two weeks on and then two weeks off. But, you know, the lunar soil is very rich in iron and titanium. <clears throat> it's been implanted by solar wind, high energy particles there. So I think we'll probably start mining the moon for space resources before we start mining asteroids. But yeah, there's a lot of precursor work that needs to be done before we uh, really get into that. Thank you, sir, for giving your time. And uh, there are many questions, but we may not be able to take it because it's a, uh, you are not well also. And this is very, very late night at your place in uh, Tampa. And we are very much thankful for your quality of time, even in this situation where you are at home and but you are not stopping science, even communication as well as fundamental exploration of uh, your area of expertise. Uh, on behalf of Regional Science Center Bhopal, it is a unit of National Council of Science Museums under the aegis of Ministry of Culture, Government of India. We are really, really thankful to your entire team of Psyche Mission, in particular, Professor Linda, the principal investigator, and she is very, very dynamic and very, very vocal and supportive. But because of commitment, she suggested your name, and I'm really, really thankful to you. Thankful to you, sir. Immediately, you accepted our request, and you are here with us on this great occasion when we are celebrating a stride day in our science center. As you all know, science center is a very important place in our society for taking science to the people through various modes of communication and popularization. And this talk was also re uh, receiving well 
uh, well, uh, so much inspiring feedback from senior scientists who are watching uh, experts right now. So I'm really, really thankful for your engaging and masterclass presentation. And I hope after the launch, that is in near future, most probably in the next year, we'll have a big program, uh, including Professor Linda, our subject to her availability, you and all, and we'll make a panel discussion kind of event on asteroid exploration. And again, thank you for your Arizona State University and your department also for providing this digital interface for happening this program in real time. Thank you oh, so much. Oh, you're most much. welcome. You're most welcome. Yeah. I'm sure Lindy will look forward to talking to you, you know, after the launch. I know yeah, she would man. enjoy doing that. Thank you very yeah, much. Man. I enjoyed talking with all of you. I said, take care and stay safe, sir. Yeah, you thank you very soon. much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. I'll sign off now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir. Take care.